I'm here today with Ted Weitzman of Southern Company. Ted's the engineering analyst who has spearheaded and implemented their program for asset management, the Lifecycle Server. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing this presentation in Europe this past year, and one thing that struck me as being significant in, in the fact that we were able to take the information from the construction aspect of a project, the beginning of the life cycle, and convey it all the way through to the operation and maintenance. Uh, and as a follow-up, Ted, there's, there's a couple questions I'd like to run through with you to maybe help us out and understand some of the details of it. Uh, first of all, internally, within your company, what did process did you go through to create an interest from executive management and whether or not there was some value to be gained by this type of process? The, that, that process within our company was actually not spearheaded by me. That was spearheaded by somebody within management who recognized in the age that we are currently doing design that tools have been created that allow us to collect and manipulate a tremendous amount of data on the design side of a project. Those tools become so robust and the information so valuable that a solution needed to be put in place to maintain the integrity and to normalize that data in a central repository. And that came from management's recognition that this uh, ground roots process was happening in design, this data was being collected, but it was not being managed. And they knew that there was going to be intuitive, intuitively, they understand that putting a process around the management of that data, putting in a system to manage that data, was going to reap benefit within the organization. Mm -hmm. and, and the person who did that within our company was, was Carl Toner, and he's the one that sold that to executive management. Okay. Um, as a starting point, I mean, you really have to start with the contractors, the personnel that are executing the project. How do you go about explaining to them what it is that you need in what form and so forth that they have to convey the information to your group? Uh, we're still actually going through that process in the company. I don't think it's, it's one that, that, that stops even after you've implemented the product. And what we learned within the Southern Company is that there was a tremendous amount of culture change that needed to take place to form a, a quote-unquote data-centric model within our design organization specifically. And how we did that, uh, I think there's only one way to do that, and that is through intense management support. You have to rely on the quality of a product. You have to assume that the quality of the product is there, that the product can execute what you anticipated it to execute. But what you really need is a management structure that supports the execution of that model that that, that, that software supports. And I, I think that's the only way you can really grow that within your business. You've got to implement cultural change through strong management support. It's a continual effort. Yes. And you, you, you take steps, and, and for us, the first step actually took four years, and it was a huge step in just getting the culture ready for data management, just getting them ready, not actually doing it, but putting the procedures, the standards, the processes in place, doing some training to get them ready for a data-centric model. And then once you take that, which is a huge step for most companies, once you take that step and you're able to bring the product online, then it's the nitty-gritty of the details of the cultural change that needs to take place, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, what do you think the biggest challenges have been for implementing sort of an asset lifecycle infra management system? And I guess maybe there's, there's three parts to that question. You have different groups that you have to deal with. You have the operations group that are going to wind up with the, with the plant at the end. You obviously have your, your project management folks, your project-oriented people. And then, of course, you have the collection of contractors and construction personnel. And each of them probably you have to handle differently. How, how does that work for your group? Uh, for us, the, the, the biggest challenge was with what, what I'm going to equate to your, your first, your, your last model, actually, the, that, that ground roots, the, the construction workers. For us, the biggest challenge was actually within our design organization. That's where the design data originates within our structure. Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge was getting that group ready for the data-centric model. Uh, because as a firm, we have transmitted knowledge through one basic means over many, many years for the life of our, our company, and that's through documents. And people within our organization are very familiar with and comfortable with managing, maintaining documentation. We had to take that similar model of document management and bring it to data. And it's something that makes, it makes them nervous. It's change. It's culture change. And, and that really has been the biggest challenge, is just preparing that group for a data-centric model, to prepare that group for managing data which they see as a much bigger ball and, and one that's much more unwieldy than managing documents, but I don't think it is, but it's perceived that way. Why do you say it, it, it's, it's a perception as, a, as opposed to reality? Uh, that's a personal experience ha has shown me that with the tools that we're using today, 
not the tools we were using 15 years ago. The tools that we're using today allow for easy manipulation and management of the data. And the perception is that quality management of that data is not achievable. And I disagree with that. I think it is achievable. I think it is achievable with the same resources and the same amount of time that you're currently doing design. Actually, I think you become more efficient with the tools once you get used to them and, and have a, a mechanism in place to ensure the quality, to automate as much as possible, of course. I don't think you really lose any time. I really, truly do believe it's a perception that it's more difficult to manage quality data within a design organization today. Okay. Couldn't say that 15 years ago with the tools probably we had in, hands, you know, in our hands 15 years ago. But today, with the tools we have today, you can do it. And I'll, I'll just put it in a simple analogy. Uh, to do this job right takes less time than to do this job incorrectly. And really? Yes, I do believe that firmly. So efficiency does have reap, reap rewards. You mentioned the, the rate of adoption and in internal learning cycles and so forth. Uh, you were satisfied with what you, you saw in the, in the rate of adoption and so forth and learning and uh, the use of the new technologies? We, for me, nothing moved fast enough, um, but I knew that. And, and whenever you talk about uh, engineering firms and engineering companies, they're usually described as big ships that are hard to turn. And the ship to take this data-centric model within our organization and really get it to work took six years. I'll, I'll say five on, on a more conservative side, five, five years, five to six years. I would like to have seen that, and I think it should have been able to happen in less time, but those cultural perceptions are, are what took us time to iron out within our organization. And we were able to iron them out. I think a lot of organizations, that's where they get stuck. And the problem really isn't in the adoption or the configuration. Oh, well, it is in the adoption. It's not so much in the configuration. But getting that culture, again, I'm going to re and, and keep, on, keep on repeating about this culture, getting that culture prepared does take time. And it didn't happen fast enough for me. But over that five, let's say, five-year period, I saw enough progress where the project itself, the life cycle management project, was able to keep traction and keep going. Getting uh, a handle on the metrics, the tangible benefits from implementing the life set lifecycle information management system is sometimes difficult. What's your experience been? What, what can you really put your hands around in terms of tangible benefits that you've been able to demonstrate to management? Now, this I'm very proud of. Uh, very early on, the, the lowest hanging fruit in our organization was document searches. And I think you'll find that in many organizations. You usually have a robust, robust document management system um, and, and the tool works the way that it's supposed to work within the organization, but from a practical standpoint, either as operations and maintenance or design personnel, construction personnel, locating and finding the document, documentation for a specific asset was very difficult in that system. You couldn't just put the, the tag number into the system and, and produce the documentation. You had to do some sort of keyword or title search, pull up a long list of drawings, sift through those drawings, find the document you were looking for. Um, and, and this really was based on the level of experience not only a person had with our organization, but with a particular facility, um, because the documentation is slightly different for every facility. Sure. Now, I went in and did a business study, and I said, well, how much time are we spending looking for documents? And it was a very large range. It was between 15 and 50 percent, and sometimes above 50 percent of a person's time annually doing document searches. Well, what if you eliminate that time or reduce it significantly? How much money do you save? And I was, very, I was able to go to management very early on and say, if you significantly reduce this time spent searching for documentation as it relates to assets, for every 200 employees within your organization, you're going to save between $1.5 million and $8 million per 200 employees. Per 200. Okay. Now, for us, as an owner-operator, you can use a 10 as a multiplier across the organization for the efficiencies that you're going to gain wow. by, by improving this process. And when I described how I came to that number, Nobody, nobody ever shook their head in a room and said, no, that doesn't make sense. You need to go back and reanalyze. They all went. Very significant savings. That makes yeah, sense. Good. But it goes even further than that. And for this specific project that we've done this implementation for, and it will spread to other projects as they come online within our organization and eventually hit our, our whole fleet with retrofit work, um, we have been able to also reap benefits. And I can say that within the six-week period between mid-December and the end of January. Within our startup commissioning group alone, we've saved them $33,000 over that six-week period. Over the two-year course of this particular project, this Kemper County Clean Coal Project in Mississippi, in that organization that will employ 40 people, 
for the course of this project, we are saving them 33,000 man hours, approximately $2 million within our organization, because we're able to implement this asset management system. And that's significant. Very significant. Thank you, Ted. Of course. We've been speaking with Ted Weitzman, talking uh, about Southern Company's asset lifecycle management and lifecycle server. Thank you, Ted.